So the E30 M3 is a car that's always been dear to my heart. I mean, it's kind of like the German 510. This is Corey, and you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. So uh, my name's Corey Rowan. Uh, I work for a automotive marketing company called Vizfire. And uh, three years ago, we came up with this kind of crazy idea called Honest Assembly. And the concept of Honest Assembly was a build team where we took uh, student amateur car enthusiasts, and in this case, we found a bunch of guys at a local car club uh, and paired them with industry mentors. And we gave them one year to build a SEMA quality car. Uh, and some of them before this had never even like changed brakes. Okay. And we kind of wanted to prove that like, you know, you could take any amateur that had like enough like perseverance, enough willpower. And if you like paired them with the right mentors in the right disciplines that you could build something that rivals everything else you see at SEMA and runs and drives. Uh, and does all the cool performance stuff. Uh, the reason for doing all this was uh, one of our clients, CRC Industries, they make brake clean. Uh, you know, they were doing some ad buys, and we said, you know, well, you know, how can we use the money better? And we came up with this idea that, you know, if we'd film the entire process of documenting the build with the students and the mentors, and then when we post it online for every view that the video series gets. CRC would donate the equivalent amount that they would have done on ad spend, but to a children's cancer charity. Okay. So, so that's a really good cause. Yeah. So, and it's a cool car. Right. So we have like, uh, you know, at least 50,000 guaranteed right now in donations, and our goal is $250,000. Is this really an M3? Yeah. So um, for all, and I'm sure there are plenty of people like hate me for this, but uh, it was a 109,000 mile running and driving S14 powered car. Um, but the car had been really neglected. So I, I'd got the car, had been sitting for around 10 years, and then I had it in storage for three years, and there wasn't a piece of rubber or plastic on the car that didn't need to be replaced. Um, and the motor, although it you know, just had 109,000 miles on it, I think it had a hard 109,000 miles. Right. So it was going to need a full, you know, down to bare metal, uh, like rotisserie style restoration, complete nut and bolt. Uh, so you know, if, if we're gonna take it down to nothing, why not put something else in it? Right. So, so this wasn't a pristine example where no. it's all the purists, you know, they're getting ready to, um, to fry you probably. But this was a car that you actually probably saved, I guess. Yeah, it had hail damage. Uh, it had, I counted 109 puck marks mm -hmm. in it from hail. Um, How much so, did the basic car cost you? Uh, you know, this, I, I bought it three years ago right before the prices really started ramping mm -hmm. up. So I paid under 20 for it. Okay. Uh, but even like just a bare shell, like a non-running driving shell are fetching around 25 right now. Yeah, just, I saw one of those. Just a shell. So to get like a complete running driving car, even with hail damage for under 20, uh, is still like a crazy buy. But like I said, it was a couple years ago. Uh, and also I benefited from buying the car from yeah, a mentor of mine. Okay. So that kind of got the whole thing started. I bought a, the car from a mentor of mine. We started mentoring these other kids and then use it as a tool to kind of, you know, pass it along. Well, let's go check out yeah, the yeah, engine. Yeah, let's do it. So oh. here it is. Wow, you know, this is crazy. I was expect, expecting it to be a, um, an S54 swap, you know, and because you know, that's kind of like what you would expect to see in the three series, right? One of the advantages of going with the S55 over like an S54 or people do like, you know, S50 or S52 stuff, um, you know, it's an all aluminum motor. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, aluminum block, aluminum head. So, you know, there is some weight savings to be there. The drawbacks over doing a V8 is obviously longer. So you got a little more weight over the nose. Um, so I mean, we countered that as best as we could. As you can see, we've got like enough clearance to the firewall here to put a playing card between the most rearward bolt on the cylinder head, which is I think a grounding bolt, and the firewall. I think it's it's somewhere around three eighths of an inch is what we've got uh, on the, on the widest point. Have you uh, corner weighted the car yet? I haven't yet, so uh, I'm yeah definitely eager to do so. Uh, but you know, there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of builders that have you know done S fifty fours. And uh, you know, even like uh, you know, S65s and stuff, the V8s, mm -hmm. uh, that you know, weigh a lot more than the original S14 did, that still have no problem being able to get the thing to balance well when they put it on scales. And it's really not as front heavy as you know, one might think. 
So, uh, so yeah, I'm confident, you know, the thing, you know, we'll handle pretty well. And, you know, we're going to be able to make up, you know, for a little bit of the weight with a good corner balance. Well, I mean, E30s came with inline sixes too. So yeah, in an so. iron block, right? Yeah, I mean, so, so I bet you that is actually a heavier motor than this. Yeah, I mean, I lifted this thing with my bare hands, and I mean, it's a little heavy. How, how much power does it put out? So, um, another cool thing about the S55, it's really, really tunable. So, from the uh, factory, they come with like 425, let's say. Uh, and then there were different versions, like the competition version, the GTS. Um, all of which are the same exact motor, really, but different power levels. Mm -hmm. So, you know, out of the box, this thing's easily tunable from anywhere from four to 500 without it, like, even hiccuping. Mm -hmm. So, we can tune it wherever we want. Uh, right now, I think it's, I think, we, we'll ask our tuner in a second, but I think it's got a GTS tune on it right now, but we've been changing that from day to day. Um, so yeah, four to five hundred is what it's you know, easily capable of right now, with uh, without having to change anything. Well, but we did do some upgrades to the motor. Okay. We uh, mainly for reliability. So we did the uh, CSF top mount. Okay. Cooler. Um, and we can't see it right now. Maybe I'll show you later. But we also have the the uh, heat exchanger for the top mount that goes in the front of the car. Okay. Which is actually CSF's race version. Mm -hmm. So it's a. Uh, the regular one's bigger than stock, and this one's like another 30%. And I mean, the cooler's like this big, and we okay. somehow squeezed it behind this bumper. Um, so we got some different additional cooling. You know, it'll last longer on track, you know, can get more laps in before it starts heating up. So I assume you have CSF radiators and oil coolers too, right? Yeah, we got all the CSF goodies. Um, you know, we have every cooler that the F80 BMW would have. So mm -hmm. we have, there's actually six coolers on this car. So, you know, we've got this top mount, we got the radiator, mm -hmm. the heat exchanger in front of that. And we even have the two additional coolers that go in the wheel wells right. on an F80, kind of like a Porsche does as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've got, you know, some coolers mounted behind these fenders. Um, and it's all plumbed with, uh, you know, custom hoses, but we use all the factory F80 mounts and coupling, so it's serviceable the cooling system service was just like a brand new F80 was. So CSFs, all their stuff came with the factory type fittings. So we want to maintain all that. Uh, so it'd be just as interchangeable. The cooling was like the biggest improvement to the, to the engine. But you know, getting it to fit and you know, getting a lower center of gravity was you know, a whole other challenge. I'm sure when we get up in the air, I'll, I'll show you. Uh, we actually raised the oil pan about an inch and a half. Mm -hmm. It's a totally custom oil pan. But we maintained all the F80's uh, oiling system. It's got a really great oiling system from the factory. We did some modifications to it to make it fit, but we were able to retain the entire factory oiling system. Uh, and then, of course, you know, we had to do custom down pipes. We had to do a custom you know, subframe and move the sway bars and move a bunch of suspension points. But it's in there, and it's as absolutely as low as we could get it and as far back as we could get it. Is your tuner here? Yeah, yeah. Oh, there you, I think he's right behind you. <laughs> Hi, Mike. How are you? Hey, Mike. Good to see you, Corey. Yeah, good to see you. Hey, Mike. How you doing? Doing well, thank you. So, what did you have to do to get this engine to run with the uh, transmission and the OEM ECU and all that? Well, there's uh, a lot of considerations when you take uh, newer technology and put it in older cars. The bus systems are extremely important. So mm -hmm. um, in a factory, later model BMW, we have a number of bus systems. We have DCAN, we have PTCAN, we have Flexray, we have most bus for the media, we have smaller buses like Lin Bus, FA CAN. I mean, there are all sorts of bus systems. And, okay. and what comes with that is, is ensuring that all of the different components and subcomponents of the car are communicate with each other properly. Um, and that includes making sure that the terminating resistance is right, that the nodes are configured right for communication, so everything can kind of jive together. Um, the goal of this project um, was to retain as much OEM functionality as possible. So this car has a factory OBD port. Okay. It's got the factory instrument cluster, and everything works as if it was a factory F80. Really complicated car, uh, like an F80, uh, that must be super difficult. I mean, there's so many different um, uh, systems in there. Like, how do you get it to, like, cooperate when probably a lot of it's missing? 
Well, basically, uh, we have to take it from the ground up and, and, and start with a, a base point and see what is communicating, um, isolate exactly what we need to communicate in order for the engine to start. Okay. Um, you know, depending on the vintage of the car, you know, we started back in the day with EWS, then we went to CAS. Now these have what's called a front electronic module. And the other F-Series cars use uh, either a, a, Z, a gateway or CAS or a body domain controller to authenticate the key and the engine module. So okay. you have to make sure that all of those things are in sync and cooperating with each other. First, the key talks to the body module. The body module authenticates with the engine module. And only then is engine start released. So if you uh, wanted to divorce certain systems like window switches or maybe like the radio or something, you can like kind of turn off those in, in, the, in the sequence? Correct. So we can go into the individual mo modules and configure them appropriately based on the hardware that is equipped in the car. For instance, not all cars had uh, curtain airbags or neat airbags or certain configuration depending on how it came. So we can go in and, and change a lot of those options uh, to match the current car's configuration so that way everything is in sync and works properly as intended. So does this car have the DTC trans transmission? This car has a manual gearbox. Oh, it does? Okay. Yes. So um, you're able to divorce the transmission control from the engine control in this car? Right. So the, the factory BMW uh, manual um, did come with the S55. So basically, we can reconfigure the transmission type that's being used. Okay. And the factory car also does rev matching. So as long as all of the sensors and, and things are in place to determine where the shifter is and all of that, it will behave exactly as a factory car. Oh, uh, okay. Is there any other of the electronics from the late model car in here? Oh, there's, there's, there's quite a bit. There's the, the main body module, the front electronic module, there's the cluster, there's the ECU. Um, the, the nice thing about the later model F80s is the front electronic module incorporates a lot of modules that originally were split up um, in prior years. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a decently sized box that controls a, a fairly sized uh, chunk of, of the factory operation. Wow, I mean that's mind-boggling that uh, everything is so nicely integrated and, and works well. Um, man, uh, and so you did a lot of the tuning by uh, just, you know, like reflashing? Correct, so all of our uh, flashing for EF and G-series cars can be done remotely. Uh, we do vehicles in, in 50 countries around the world, so this one, um, this car as it stands right now is probably producing about 560 horsepower. Okay. Um, as Corey said earlier, these are very tunable motors. Uh, there are factory, factory variations that varied from the low 400s up to the GTS, which had just under 500 from the factory. Um, there are some things that we couldn't incorporate in terms of, uh, because of space constrictions, like mm -hmm. the electromechanical power steering, um, but the goal at the end of all this is to have fully working traction control, ABS, and, and as much of the factory systems as possible integrated into this build. Man, that, that is mind-boggling impressive. So um, the fuel pump is controlled by the um, ECU through a module through the CAN bus system too, right? Right. So in the back we have what's called the rear electronic module, which is sort of like the rear power distribution block for the back. Mm -hmm. And the factory engine computer communicates over the bus systems with the factory fuel pump module. And that is located in the, in the back of the car in the trunk. You can't see it. And then Corey and team integrated the F80 fuel pump into the E30 system. So it's got all of the F80 electronics and pumps, everything integrated into the E30 factory system. So it's a far cry from a boost dependent mechanical regulator. Oh yes, absolutely. Oh man, well let's go check this out. I, I really want to see underneath the car and all the cool stuff there. Great, let's take a look. So yeah, like this engine's pretty shoehorned in here. Like, uh, what, what did you do? You were talking about uh, stuff you did to keep the CG low and, and right. things. Um, so the oil pan, pretty much the only thing that's left from the factory oil pan is the perimeter. Uh, everything else in the oil pan has been fabricated, but we, uh, we kept the original level sensor location and um, we decreased the height of the oil pan or you know moved it up chopped it whatever way you want to look at it by about like 75 millimeters or so okay so we could drop it lower uh, 
But when we did that, we had to like put a lot of effort into maintaining the rest of the oiling system. Because the F80's got a pretty cool oiling system from the factory. Okay. So we had to remake a lot of the internal pieces. And then of course, you can see we added these, the wings here. And then we put, uh, you know, baffles, little flappers inside on both these wings. So that not only like, you know, allowed us to drop it, but make up for a capacity. Uh, and, so do you have the same capacity as stock? Uh, I have a quarter of a quart less than okay. stock. So, uh, but I've got a plan for that. <laughs> oh, really? I mean, it doesn't look like you have an, like an inch to spare in this area. Yeah, so like um, kind of version 2.0 um, is, would be our third subframe. And I want to go forward with the whole subframe. Okay. Um, and then be able to extend the size of the pan by another like two inches. Okay. And essentially, you know, mount the steering rack from the front. Uh, and I mean, that, that buys me like two to three inches right here. I can do whatever I want. So you want to um, move the steering rack so you can get, get rid of uh, the, the tie rod. Right, Position yeah. adapters. Yep. Yeah, the steering rack currently, in order to maximize the size of the oil pan uh, and get the, the engine as low as possible, we had to move the steering rack uh, down 28 millimeters and over 25. Um, and by doing so, you know, it, it screwed up, like bump steer and all sorts of stuff. Uh, so we've like, you know, we've, we've done a few things this steering to try to compensate for that. Yeah, you kind of put the adapters at an angle to get the tie yeah. rod ends yep. up higher. Yeah, so um, we make up for the vertical difference with the clevis uh, pushing, you know, the inner tie rods up. And then to have equal length, because since we move the whole rack over, we're gonna have a, a shorter rock tie rod on one side, longer one on the other. We have offset clevises that put the tie rods back at equal length. So we'd have, so we'd have equal bump steer on both sides. So it wouldn't act funky, like making a right hand versus a left hand corner. I mean, I'm right now you can tell the bump steer is not as bad as some cars come stock, so. Yeah, it would, we worked pretty hard on that. So let's talk about okay. uh, some of the coolers and okay. that. Uh, that integration. Yeah, so this is the factory F80 type cooler, right? Normally on the F80 M3, it's mounted just in front of the um, of the radiator and intercooler right. exchanger. Okay. And it like sticks out. Uh, there's no room for it in this car, so we had to move it back. And we actually have a belly pan that's not on here right now that covers this whole area, and we feed air, we catch the air in, pump it through. Okay. Um, so. We did custom lines, but otherwise, it, just like the other coolers on the car, it uses all the BMW, you know, quick disconnects and everything. So that's it, the uh, engine oil cooler. Yes, it's the engine oil cooler. And then I, I know you might not be able to see it right now, but we also have both of the auxiliary uh, F80 coolers, you know, in these in the wheel wells. Yeah, in the wheel wells. Yeah. Um, and you have the fans for them and all that too. So that's pretty. Yeah, cool. we got four fans on the car. Um, you know, we've got a fan controller. Uh, so we, the one thing in the cooling system that's a deviation from the factory car, uh, the factory car had a single very large variable fan. Mm -hmm. And so be, for packaging reasons, we use four smaller fans and then we use an aftermarket controller to okay. manage them. Yeah, so we've got high and low settings. Uh, so what do you have for suspension? Yeah, so the suspension, um, so we did a lot of the car setup when it came to uh, spring rates, and then even like a lot of restoration parts we got from Bimmer World. Okay. Uh, James Clay, who runs Bimmer World, they uh, you know they have uh, you know big you know GT4 race car outfit, and you know they're kind of BMW aficionados. They guided us a lot on the suspension and a lot of the other chassis components on what to do, what not to do, mistakes they had made. Uh, and they led us to MCS, so motion control suspension. Right. So the dampers are motion control suspension, three-way remote okay. dampers. Um, and we originally ran those with you know factory um, 96 and up M3 control arms. Mm -hmm. And we weren't quite able to get the adjustment we wanted, uh, but we chose them because they were durable. Okay. So then we finally found a better compromise. We started working with uh, SLR speed, um, and they they offer some off the shelf BMW tubular control arms, uh, but those weren't quite what we wanted either. So we had them make these. They're similar to the factory, but the they've got a, they're a little more obtuse. 
Uh, so a couple extra degrees forward of caster built into them. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we had you know these you know custom um, you know bump steer and roll center correction pieces mm -hmm. made. So you know the car is a good bit lower than stock, uh, but I mean we've got a really great angle on our control arm, um, you know for roll center and you know as close as we can to ideal for the tie rod. I mean it still needs some work and it's like not I said, perfect, but it's not actually as that bad. Yeah, for like a car that's as modified as this thing is, like I, I really wanted to maintain drivability. Uh, we were trying to not be like a cliche SEMA car and have it just, you know, be a pretty car that can sit there. Like we want the car to be able to be tracked. We want it to be able to be drivable and like, you know, to, you know, wail on this thing and not have to worry about it. We don't want to make excuses for it. How about you your anti-sway bar? Yeah, so the factory uh, anti-sway bar runs right along here. Uh, behind the subframe, mm -hmm. which is not a problem in a normal E30 because a normal E30 has a front sump. Mm -hmm. So we went, you know, had to go rear sump to maintain some of the cool systems that the uh, the F80 had in the S55. So we relocated the sway bar up front. So um, it hangs off the front of the subframe, mm -hmm. and then you know we flipped it, and then we just have custom link uh, mounts there with the swedge rods and. Uh, the tie, tie rod ends. How, how about your, um, ends. your brake system? So the brake system forced a lot of other things that ended up being great in the end. So we went with uh, AP Racing Ratty Cows, which we got from Essex Parts. Mm -hmm. And these are actually the F80 spec okay. Ratty Cows. So the, uh, the pistons are sized for the F80. Okay. And we did that because we're also running the F80's ABS system and we converted the whole car to four channel. And so that forced us to change, you know, the rear brakes to keep the right bias. So then we changed the rear brakes and, you know, had the right piston size to match the F82. You're running so the F80 master cylinder also? I'm running an F80 master cylinder and brake booster. Um, to run that, we had to uh, move the whole pedal box um, and then move everything around on the firewall to account for it and uh, do some, like, wizardry getting it all to fit, but the F80 brake booster and, and master cylinder are in the car. It's a, it's a really tight fit up there it's, when we're looking yeah, at that. Yeah, it's tight, yeah. But like I said, we're like, if we were gonna do the swap, you know, I just didn't want to cut corners. The easier thing would have been to, you know, go boosterless, you know, throw everything on the inside of the car, uh, you know, put my reservoir, hide my reservoirs inside, uh, and you know, just go manual brakes like a lot of people do. Uh, but we really want to maintain drivability. So, I mean, little details like that, you know, ate up a lot of time, for sure. <laughs> and everything is, like, so beautiful under here. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it just means we need to drive it more. <laughs> I mean, uh, this fabrication for the downpipes is, like, exquisite. Yeah, and all pie cuts. So we had a good friend of ours, uh, Nate at Albro's uh, Fabrication in Denver, uh, he does a lot of aerospace work. Okay. Uh, but he's like a drift junkie, he's a car guy. Um, so, yeah, he helped us out getting these downpipes to fit. It was, it was pretty pretty tough. <laughs> and, and you uh, have cats in it. Yeah, these are the Vibrants. Mm -hmm. uh, each one of them would go to 500 horsepower. Uh, we're running two in line. They're flowing you know, more than enough air. So there's really no compromise with them. What transmission are you running? Uh, this is the transmission out of the F80. Okay. So we had so fitting this transmission involved, you know, some fitment on the trans tunnel. Um, but you know, with this car, we were trying to balance everything, and you know, we could only clearance the tunnel so much before we started having to compromise our HVAC. Okay. Because we're running the full HVAC system uh, oh, behind okay. the dash. Uh, so as we move the tunnel, we move all the HVAC mounting points. Um, so it. Yeah, it was a tight fit, but it's in there. Oh, what clutch are you running in flywheel? It's, a, it's the factory F80. So the factory F80 is uh, it's a dual clutch. It's a, oh, it's, okay. fan, it's a fantastic clutch. It can hold a ton of power, um, you know, and it's and it's really smooth. It's and, a twin disc. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, twin disc. Um, yeah, it, it's fantastic. It it holds the power we need to. It, it makes it streetable. And this car's so light, you know. Um. Man, I'm just almost speechless in how clean and well integrated everything is. I mean, <laughs> thanks, man. Uh, I'm I'm pretty picky about how I build my own cars, and this is like 
better than what I do ever. Dude, that means a lot. <laughs> First of all, I don't think that's true. And that means a lot, man. It really does. I would have just done yeah. the pedal box. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a, so the, before we even started, I did two years of planning and then we built the car. Once we got the students involved, we built the car in 11 months with them. Um, so yeah, it was two years of planning and 11 months of like, you know, five to seven days a week. I'd really like to revisit this car once you uh, do your phase two um, uh, cross member and yeah, get totally. your tie rod positions really good and good. Uh, yeah, how your good sway good. bar, redo that. That's gonna be really cool. Yeah, it's little by little, step by step. Oh, on the cooler self, I forgot to mention, we have all the, it's way up here. You might not be able to see it right now on the camera, but uh, we have all the factory F80 um, electric pumps in the cooling system. Okay. All that stuff's plumbed in, it kicks on at the right time, all that. Let's check out the back of the car. Yeah, totally, man. So the back of the car is pretty impressive also. Um, well, I guess let's start at, at the top. Like, uh, what kind of differential is this? So it's a uh, BMW medium case differential. Okay. It's what we started out with, uh, which is the same thing that's in an E30. Um, so the major changes were we have some great friends. I mentioned our mentors. One of them is Dan Fitzgerald at Diffs Online. And uh, Dan like went through everything, helped us uh, pick, pick gearing. So, you know, it's uh, new bearings. Uh, it's a 338 gear. The factory M3 was a 410. Okay. Uh, you know, size of the tires, transmission, everything. We ended up with the 338. Uh, he machined out the uh, posi track unit or the limited slip unit. Uh, to hold um, spacers and um, uh, four clutches instead of the factory two that they normally come with. There's only two clutches per side in the factory? Yeah, so wow. he's machined it out. It's got four in it now. Uh, and then he also changed the ramp angles. Okay. So they're factory 45, 45 ramps, mm -hmm. and uh, I think it's, it's 30, 90 now. Okay. So on D cell, the thing turns in you know, really well, and then locks right back up when you get on the throttle. Mm -hmm. And then on the, the gears, he did uh, rim polishing, same thing on all the bearings, and, uh, you know, went through it like a pro, you know. Okay. And uh, can this differential take the amount of horsepower that the engine uh, puts up, like, reliably? A lot of turn? drift guys will run these diffs, like, you know, six, 700 horsepower range, mm -hmm. um, and they're probably getting a lot more abuse than what we're doing. You know, because this car is more geared towards road course. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it can handle it. I don't know how many launches it can handle, but it can handle it for now. The weaker point is the, uh, is actually the axles. Um, okay. The diff, diff is pretty beefy. What have you done to the axles? So, there's not a whole lot of options other than going with uh, larger uh, Porsche uh, CVs. So, which is not, you can't, you can do that. Um, but the factory axles hold up well. The problem is you just can't get good factory axles anymore. Okay. They're like impo hard to come by, and the ones you can get are usually rebuilt. Uh, we actually sourced a, a brand new set uh, we were able to find out of Europe. They're sitting on the shelf somewhere. So these are actually just br completely just brand new OE axles. It looks like you moved your cross member upwards. We were talking about earlier, you get a lot of camber curve when you lower these cars, mm -hmm. right? And then that you know, exacerbates the, you know, the off throttle or lift over steer mm -hmm. and then plus like the twitchiness on throttle. Mm -hmm. So an easy way to correct that if you're lowering it is, you know, moving the subframe up. So the subframe is moved up, I think 12 or 13 millimeters higher into the chassis. So that gives us a little more adjustment. Um, and then we've got a Centrix um, on the ends of the trailing arms. For oh, you could see those. Yeah. yeah. So those are actually, I'm not sure what BMW they're off of, but they're like uh, basically crash bolts off of another model BMW. Okay. And Bimmer World machines, uh, little plates that fit on the side that it runs in. So um, we welded them in there. We had to spend actually a lot of time, you know, just getting them really, you know, perfectly square. Because um, a lot of times people throw those in, they don't pay attention. And then you make adjustments and then it puts a suspension in a bind unless everything's totally, you know, perfectly square when you weld it. Um, at the same time we were doing that, we are working with another one of our mentors, Josh from Project Baja. Mm -hmm. And um, Josh, 
It helped us reinforce these. So we built the rest of the trailing arm off of a early Group A DTM okay. car design. So all the reinforcements they did on the early Group A cars, um, we did on this one. Is that adding uh, like these? Yeah, so there's three reinforcements. There's you know one here going to the pickup point. Um, you know, there's one here spanning. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, A, the A arm style, the trailing arm. Okay. And then there's one up top you, you can't see um, that comes down that triangulates uh, the hub to, uh, to the arm. Uh, version two. <laughs> version two, we're going to completely scrap these arms and we're going to go, you know, just with time joints everywhere. Uh, we're going to do kind of a mixture of the early group A DTM arms and the later ones. The later ones had additional reinforcements that ran across the top and picked up the top side of the hub as well. Um, so uh, I used to run Specky 30 cars mm -hmm. and anybody running Specky 30 cars knows, you know, if you want to be fast, you got to you know, because they're momentum cars, you, you got to run run over the bumpers, right? Always on the gators with them. And what happens is, you know, the the hub starts to bend in over mm -hmm. time, uh, just because you know they're just not meant for that kind of abuse. So a high horsepower, heavy sprung car, uh, you've got to do a lot of reinforcements to the trailing arms. Um, so you're not running a rear sway bar. No, I'm not. Um, so you know, for this chassis, there's a lot of debate as to you know the benefits of running a rear sway bar on this car. Um, a lot of track guys uh, don't when they get when they get a lot of uh, spring in the rear. Um, yeah, I think there's some benefits from running it, but the uh, problem I think most people are actually running in to is the geometry of the rear sway bar going into a bind mm -hmm. um, in the suspension travel. Uh, so Bimworld actually makes a sway bar for this car that fixes that. And okay. so that's the one we're going to be running is um, there's it's you know it, it's made for the car to not go into a bind when the trailing arms are in compression. The exhaust is like pretty wonderful like it's transitioning from round to oval with a nice smooth transition. Amazing pie cuts in the oval section and looks like it's going to a Burns muffler and yeah yeah it's it's loud. Um, so the design was based off of um, a system that Active Auto Works has. Mm -hmm. So the S55 engine gets a lot of flack for sounding like a weed eater. And uh, Active Auto Works, you know, tried a few things and they did something really simple that no one else had done before them on that motor was just merge the two and try to cancel out the pulses mm -hmm. instead of going true dual all the way back like they are from the factory, like most of the aftermarket ones out there do. Um, so it made sense. So we uh, tried to follow their design into how long their pipes were before and at, before the merge. And then we worked with again with our friend Nate at our bars and uh, you know, he helped us put it together. I don't think so. uh, you could even package a dual system under here. Very no, easily. I don't think you could. We're, one thing worth mentioning here is because we only had 11 months to build this car, we actually built two cars at the same time. Uh, so we had one car that we were doing all the body work and trim work on, and then we had a second car that we were doing all the engine fitment and fabrication on. So this exhaust from Nate and um, you know, a lot of stuff we did on the subframe, uh, the stuff from Project Baja, and then our friend Aaron Flattery at Flattery Fabrications, uh, he, he was helping us with the oil pan. All that was done on a completely different car. So we had a, a separate running E30 uh -huh. with an S55 in it. Uh, so this is technically the second S55 swap, uh, but it's the first one to like actually drive. We, we never actually drove our other test car. So we did all that fabrication and then we moved everything over. And I think it's just a statement to how well like a lot of the pieces were fabricated that it just bolted up, you know, when uh, we switched chassis. So we just had to show this because this is like, perhaps one of the baddest ass things on any feature car we've done, you, you actually have center locks on the street car. Um, so this is a street center lock that actually has like a, like a locking collar so it doesn't back loose while you're driving. Yeah, so uh, wheel and tire fitment, brakes, center lock, packaging that all together in something that could be streetable and do track duty was kind of tough. Uh, so again, help from Bimworld, they pointed us towards uh, Forgeline, 
Mm -hmm. And Forge Line is really cool about it. Uh, we basically sent Forge Line all the CAD drawings for these AP Ratty Cals. Mm -hmm. And you know, I mentioned before we wanted to use these because they maintain the F80's brake bias. Mm -hmm. They're also really cool because these are the endurance racing versions. So With the really got, thick pads. Exactly. So they got 25 millimeter thick pads versus like what you normally see around 18, you know? Um, We're actually but, familiar with this configuration oh, of caliper because, <laughs> believe it or not, it's for a different application, but like for time attack cards, if you have brake vents and all that, it interferes with the arrow. So we've been going to the uh, bigger calipers with the thicker pads so we don't need to vent the brakes because the thick pad helps keep the... Um, heat out of the fluid, and that actually seems to work pretty good. That's, uh, it's funny you mentioned that. We've got provisions for um, brake cooling on this car, and SX Parts, who you know we source the, the calipers from, and also they make the, the kit that adapts it to this hub, you know, and the rotor. Um, they actually told us to remove it. They're like, forget it, it's just gonna get in the way. If anything, it's gonna uh, make it overheat because it's gonna you know, block air. So if the people in our audience don't know, the Radical caliper is the new AP caliper that's asymmetrical, that uh, has a lot of milling, a lot of area for the, um, the uh, uh, I guess it's a lot of area like on the other side of the caliper, so it's like a lateral bridge to make stiffness. A lot of the area around the pistons has been removed to make up for that extra uh, extra material on the side. It, it's a really innovative caliper. Um, we worked with Essex and we used the Radical caliper on one of our Project Mustangs, but um, it's kind of like an offshoot of their uh, real, like even their F1 technology. It's so crazy. The first time I picked one up, uh, I was blown away because, I mean, I think it's somewhere around four to six pounds lighter per corner. I mean, it looks heavy, but it's light. It's, 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 it's so much, this whole setup is like so much lighter than, uh, you know, the regular F80 stuff. And it's about the same weight as what, what was on the original E30 M3. So we got all this weight here, which you think, well, it's all this unsprung weight, but it's really a lot lighter than one would imagine. Uh, I, I guess with the video too, you can't really see how radical the caliper is and all, all the machining and, and the uh, asymmetrical backside and all that. When I'm trying to explain to people, I always tell people, hey, you know, like here's a caliper, you know, it's, you know, it's, you know, our, uh, let's just say, you know, it's a, it's a rectangle, right? And it's bolted on this side, you know, to your hub. So when you break, what's it gonna wanna do? It wants to move this way. It wants to become a parallelogram, right? Uh, so what AP basically did is they looked at where are all those force vectors? What's keeping it from twisting and becoming a parallelogram? And then they removed all the material, you know, you know, where you know it was not adding any structure. So you end up with this like crazy wild shape based on you know forces from the piston, forces from it trying to twist itself onto the hub, um, and then it's just you know you get something that weighs next to nothing. You get 25 millimeter pad. Don't have to work with cooling. Is this a uh, like a 355 by 32 rotor? It is. And, um, you know, nice veins, and I mean, this is a lot of brake for a car this light. So I, I don't think you're ever gonna <laughs> be having brake issues with this. Well, you know, there's a Michelin, you know, Cup 2's on there right now. But for the track, you know, when we swap on a slick on there. Uh, what size um, well, are your wheels we'll and tires? Fast enough. Uh, wheels and tire, it's uh, 245s in the rear. Right now we've got a 225 in the front, mm -hmm. uh, but we're gonna be going to a 245 square setup okay. all the way around. Um, How wide is your wheel? It's an 18? Yeah, it's an 18 by eight and a half. Okay, and what's the offset? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head, but the we had to work a lot on the offsets. Because of the center lock? The center lock and um, and like on the rear rear brakes, we moved the hub. We did, did a lot of stuff like that. I want to say it's around 25 to 30. That, that sounds about I right. Think it's somewhere yeah. around. The 225 is the OEM tire size for the front, isn't it? It's, uh, I think it's a little smaller than that. But yeah, it's uh, it's it's not as big as we'd like. Definitely want to go to the 245. I mean, it seems like uh, it's just the constraints of the wheel well size that's going to. Um, be hard for you to put something much bigger, right? The brakes really dictated a lot. Uh, if we had gone down to a 17, we 
probably could have gotten, probably would have gotten, uh, could have gotten like a, maybe a 255 in there with a lot of clearancing. Mm -hmm. uh, so I fit a 255 in an M3 before, uh, and you have to cut away pretty much everything and hammer out, you know, all the sheet metal. Um, you can safely fit a 245 up here, so so I went that route. Okay. Yeah. Man, I mean, the attention to detail is amazing. Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, when you take it back down to bare metal, it looks a lot prettier when you paint it. Well, I just, I mean, I dig all the components, uh, the, the level of uh, everything. I mean, this car is so awesome. Thanks, man. Uh, some things you can't really see from the outside of the car that are in here is uh, the, the E30 convertibles were like, they're total spaghettis. Mm -hmm. right? They just, they're noodles, they moved everywhere. Um, so the factory had a lot of bracing in the inner wheel well kind of tying down to the torque boxes okay. and then up to the shock towers. Uh, so uh, we purchased as many of those as we could. There were like, I think, two out of six that we could find worldwide, brand new. And the rest of them, we cut off E30 convertibles. Okay. Uh, so we've actually added, you know, underneath the fender and behind here, all the reinforcements that the E30 convertible used and welded it you know, into the unibody. sweet. To stiff out the front end. Um. That's, I guess we didn't talk about it too, but uh, you media blasted this car to a bare chassis, right? Yep. And then you seam welded it and added some of the OEM convertible reinforcements. Yeah, I wish there had been more seam welding. Uh, you know, you always look back and like, we should have done more. But yeah, there's some seam welding, all the OEMs, um, reinforcements. Um, for the convertible, and then the rear, we just re we reinforce the shock tower, reinforce the the floor, and then you know use that cross brace that ties into the floor. So uh, hopefully we don't punch those rear springs, the shock towers. I doubt it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty it's pretty stiff. <laughs> yeah, no, no doubt. Uh, but yeah, we uh, we got lucky being able to you know send the, the the drawings you know from Essex that they just handed over. They're really cool about that right over the forge line, and forge line was just able to punch the wheels out. We gave them the offsets, we measured that, but getting the uh, caliper, these caliper clearances for these and incorporating the center locks into the wheel was, I think, a challenge. But they pulled it off in less than a week and overnighted us the wheels the Friday before SEMA. That's awesome. Yeah, it, it was rad. Yeah, Steve over there, he, he knew what we were trying to achieve and we've been talking about it for months. And uh, when it came time to pull the trigger, he just, he made it happen. And uh, he really like kept our original design requirements, keeping it within a DTM theme. We were kind of loosely basing off the wheel colors and everything off what was on the Evo 3 mm -hmm. M3 with a mixture of the look of the BBS E50s that were ran in the early DTM cars. And so then we ended up with this kind of like mesh of the two designs. So Corey, uh, since you converted the coilovers, you probably had to, do some modification to the unibody back here since you're moving the stress of the spring around, right? Like, did you reinforce the shock towers? Yeah, so before we knew we were doing the true rear coilovers, or, you know, should, since, shouldn't say that, before we committed to it, <laughs> we were on the fence, uh, we were just looking at some rear strut braces, and it turns out that you know, we could package kind of a standardized rear strut brace uh, with a lot of weld-in reinforcements that are shock towers, and get something that's you know removable and uh, you know a little little more friendly in terms of space for a streetcar than a full cage. And by welding everything in and reinforcing the shock towers and the floor, we you know we stiffened it up for the springs, and we also were able to have like a better diff mount because our diff diff mount actually pickup point is. Uh, goes to the, the same reinforcement. Oh, so it's all triangulated to the yeah. towers. Uh, yeah, you can see that there. Yeah, so it tries to punch through the rear shock tower. It's also pulling up on the diff. And I know from like Andy Hately and those guys, when they're trying to drift these things, that the differential tearing out of them is a big deal. So yeah. <laughs> it's really cool to see that you addressed it by unitizing the entire uh, back of the car. And th that's a very clean integration you did. Yeah, so like most things in this car, it would have been a lot easier if we could have just put a cage in it, move the firewall, move the transmission tunnel. Uh, yeah, instead, we wanted to pack all the streetcar features and have all the same stiffening. So this is just an example of you know, another smart workaround or what we think is smart 
uh, getting the chassis stiffening we want. It's also a good hiding spot for a false rear panel. Behind our, uh, that, the bar you see going between the two shock towers is false. It, it's removed, and then that's where well, we Well, in California, everything's uh, legal now, so you don't <laughs> have to worry about uh, going through elaborate things to smuggle. <laughs> yeah, we have all, uh, all the, uh, the correct F80 components and modules hidden behind that panel. Oh, Mike, do you want to tell us about some of the electronics back there? Sure. Uh, back here, we have the rear electronics module, which is basically the uh, rear junction box for the car, and that provides the supply for the fuel pump module and mm -hmm. the fuel pump and it's using the factory fuel pump module and uh, basically you can plug in and it will into the OBD port in the interior of the car and it will smog just like a factory car would. Oh man, that's incredible. So um, does it have, um, did, did you go to a referee station and actually smog it or uh, will it just? So at the moment it has uh, all the factory catalytic converters installed right so um if those catalytic uh, not not factory but uh aftermarket mm -hmm. catalytic converters so if those are clean enough to um satisfy the emissions monitors of the ecu it will pass just like a stock car would that's pretty incredible i'm getting a cramp in my leg so congratulations corey you built a car that even my jaded ass thinks is really cool and uh I'm, I'm kind of speechless. And um, congratulations for like, I know this is routine for you, but uh, the crazy world of multiplexing and modern OEM electronics, you seem to have mastered getting it all into this uh, vintage chassis. So if somebody is working on the late model BMW or wants to do a crazy project, how do they get a hold of you, Mike? So they can go to our website. Our official co company name is, BP, is Bavarian Performance Motorsport, but we've shortened that to BPM Sport, so bpmsport.com. Okay, uh, and like, um, how, how do people contact you and get to see all your videos and all yeah. the stuff on this car? So uh, I'm at vizfire.com, and uh, the project, Honest Assembly, is at honestassembly.com. That's also where people can uh, donate to you know, the can children's cancer charity we're trying to raise money for. And if they want to see videos on the entire build end to end, which is a lot, uh, it'll come out on the Drive uh, YouTube channel here uh, this summer. Well, it's awesome. And if you want to see more videos like this and you like Moto IQ's content, uh, come to our YouTube channel and subscribe. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, guys. This is killer, man. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Pleasure to meet you.